கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to the introduction to Bhakti Bhava. Now, this is the next series after Ananya Bhakti. So if you haven't seen that series, go back and look at it now. Because everything we're doing in this series is based on that one. And if you haven't seen it, it's going to be very difficult to... to understand what we're talking about. So go back and get that context, that background, because everything we're talking about in this series is going to be in the context of Ananya Bhakti. So what is Bhakti Bhava? Bhakti Bhava means transcendental, ecstatic emotions in relation to with God or the self. If we are in duality, then the ego, the world, and God seem real. So we'll start from that point of view. But where we're going is Ananya Bhakti, where we understand that God is, is simply a reflection of the self, Brahman, in the individuated mind. So in this way, what we think of as God and the world are simply like reflections in a broken mirror. And when we can get the mirror put back together again <laughs> and see things as they really are, And we understand there is no I, there is no thou, there is no God, there is no world. There is only the self. So in the non-dual consciousness of the self, there is no need for I because there is no other. And there is no need for world because there is no other. I, I is everything. The self is the all. So once that's realized, once you are coming from that space and you look at the phenomenon, then you can see very clearly that they are simply a layer of illusion on top of the real self. That's a different kind of consciousness. But as long as we're seeing the phenomena as real in themselves, then we are still in Anya Bhakti. Anya Bhakti means relating to God or the self as other, as another person, another being. So that's all right. That's a place to start. But we have to develop from that point. And how do we do that? By seeing ourselves in relationship with God, in relationship with the self. And this relationship is called bhakti. The relationship is the context for energy going back and forth. And this energy produces feelings. When the prana, when the life energy is in touch with different elements and different qualities, it produces different phenomena. And these phenomena are collectively called bhava. Bhava, again, means ecstatic, transcendental emotions. So what do we mean by ecstatic? Ecstatic means high energy. These are not 
simply dull, faded uh, feelings of a degenerate world. Uh, it's impossible to be uh, dull and have bhava. If a person is jaded by too much engagement with the material world, they can't experience bhava. Bhava means high energy. Huh? We gave one time a chart of the seven energy levels of the seven chakras. So bhava comes in at level five, six, and seven of the heart chakra. Bhava is a very high energy phenomenon. So ecstasy means intense feelings, intense emotions. When the energy of life, prana, is concentrated and contacts the elements. Now remember, in Upadesha Undiyar, Ramana talks about eight kinds of worship of God or eight forms of God to be worshipped in bhakti. And those forms are the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and akasha, ether or space. And the sun and moon, which means the devas, the forms of the demigods and gods. And finally, jiva, which is the reflection of the self. So these eight forms of God are meant to be worshipped with love, with emotion, to have a relationship with them, and that's bhakti. And the feelings inspired by that relationship are bhava. So everyone is having a relationship with God at every moment. Whether you are aware of it or not. And this is why I say, and I have said many times in these series, that everyone is having spiritual experiences all the time. But they're simply not aware of them. God is there all the time. The self is there all the time. And what is the self? Pure consciousness. And so we are also conscious at all times, even during deep sleep, when there's nothing to be conscious of, but we're still conscious. We don't remember deep sleep because there's no content there's no phenomena to be aware of. But we remember that we slept. The next morning we say, oh, I slept very well. I feel so refreshed. So we are aware. We are conscious at all times. Because why? We are a reflection of the self. So therefore, this relationship with God is going on all the time. At any moment, we have a particular relationship with God. Now, what is a relationship? A relationship is a taste, a taste of love. We have a relationship with ourselves. We have a relationship with our parents. We have a relationship with our brothers and sisters, if we have any, or with our friends. We have a relationship with our significant other, with our mate. We have a relationship with our enemies. We have a relationship with nature, the world. And of course, we have a relationship with God. So what flavor, what taste is that relationship? That's called bhakti rasa. And that's going to be the subject of another series later on. But first we have to begin with the idea that we all have this relationship with God at every moment. Usually we're not aware of it. And that's our detriment. 
That's our fall down. That's our ignorance, actually. So the flavor of this relationship is the bhava, or the emotional taste. Just like people are basically all the same. Yet, we make a distinction between the relationship we have with ourselves, and with our parents, and with our children, and with our lovers, isn't it? Why do we distinguish between them? And why do we feel that certain things are appropriate in certain relationships, but not in others? That's because of different tastes. And what makes one thing appropriate in one relationship and inappropriate in another relationship is whether it adds to or enhances that taste or whether it conflicts. In other words, whether it's harmonious or disharmonious with the taste of that particular relationship. So I can give many examples, and I will give many examples when we get to the actual tastes. But right now I want to give kind of a general picture so you understand where we're going here. The problem with talking about transcendental relationships and emotional tastes, bhava, is that we have no words in our Western language. We have no terminology. We have no ontology with which to recognize, categorize, and discuss those tastes. So we have to introduce terminology from the Vedas. The Vedic scriptures have a tremendously elaborate terminology of transcendental tastes. Bhavas. So we're going to have to introduce that terminology and give some rough equivalents because there actually is no direct translation. The subject of transcendental emotional tastes simply has not come up in the context of Western theological and philosophical literature. So that's why I say, compared to the Vedas, Western culture is poverty-stricken. Huh? Even though we are experiencing these tastes at every moment, we have no words to describe them. That doesn't mean they're not there. That doesn't mean they're not real. But we have difficulty to recognize them to taste them and to enjoy them because we have no terminology. See, this is the ontological problem that if we have a category of understanding, a conceptual classification for a particular phenomenon, we can recognize it as a thing. Now, whether we like it or we don't like it, or whether we want it or we don't want it, or whether we can work with it or not, that's another discussion. But right now, simply to be conscious of these transcendental emotional tastes, bhavas, is very difficult for the typical person. It requires a special study. And why do we want to make this study? Why do we want to go through all this work? Huh? Because these ecstatic, transcendental emotions, these tastes of bhavas, are extremely blissful, very satisfying, aesthetically rewarding. So once we have a terminology in our ontology for this particular phenomenon of bhakti, then we can recognize it. Then we can be aware of it. We can classify it properly and enjoy it. Huh? And you'll see there are many, many ways to enjoy this relationship with God. And this is what saintly people are doing when they are apparently just sitting there doing nothing. There was a study released a little while back that said that the average Western person 
would rather receive electric shocks than sit alone in a plain, quiet room. Why is that? Because when they are thrown back on themselves with no external object, they're in difficulty. They're in so much difficulty, they're actually in pain. So much pain that they would rather give themselves electric shocks. Well, why is that? They have no map of the inner landscape. They have no chart of their own phenomena, their own feelings. They think, I'm bored. I'm bored to tears. Huh? And it's so painful because they think there's nothing. But actually, there is this relationship with God present and active at every moment. Simply, we cannot recognize it. And that's why people who have not done this study, who have not done this work, this sadhana, think that being alone in a quiet room all by themselves with nothing happening, a silent place, is exquisitely painful. So much so they would rather shock themselves. <laughs> Poor rascals. So this series is going to be about the terminology and the meaning of these relationships, these ecstatic transcendental emotions, bhavas, and how we can enjoy our relationship with God at every moment. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Karadakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yida.